can't do nothing, life's going to be terrible, it ain't going to be all that it is now, and I keep saying to them, but God, all that's true, but God disagrees, all that may have been, but God said pray, all that could have been, but God said nothing is impossible, and I thank God, when I get to the message, but she reminds me so much, one of the surgeons one night came out and was talking about all that hadn't happened, and she had been in surgery too long, and they couldn't continue any further, and then we got the talking and I told him, well, we prayed about it and you're kind of doing what I said you ought to have done years ago. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I believe in God. I said, well, that's enough. Then go be an instrument of God and let God do what he's going to do. And sometimes what we need to do is remember that we are instruments of God. Amen. We are not authors of God. We have not created God with our own hands or out of our own minds. We are instruments of the true and living and eternal God to whom all things belong. And so we can ask God to change things anytime. We can ask God, Lord, this has never been done before. Let it happen now. When there was a mist that went up and watered all the earth and suddenly God changed and then rain happened and the waters came and overflowed. These are things that hadn't happened until God decided it's going to happen now. Your miracle that hasn't happened, it could happen right now. According to your faith, be it unto you. Somebody said, well, why did everybody else get the blessing? Listen, according to your faith, <laughs> be it unto you. I've seen enough now that I'm beginning to understand that God literally can do everything. You know, after you, <clears throat> mother said, you, you, after a while, you begin to understand the old folk. Well, now I understand some of the same folk and the things they said and did. Because after a while, you begin to know God can do everything because I haven't seen God do most things. I've seen him heal cancers and open blind eyes. I've seen him heal broken bones and let folk hear that could not hear. I've even seen him grow hair. I remember early in ministry, I was a young minister and someone came and they were older folks. And the woman said to me, my husband's losing his hair. I want you to anoint this oil and I'm going to go rub it on his head. <laughs> My faith kind of might not have been there yet. And it wasn't Rogaine with Minoxidil. It was blessed oil from the altar. But I realized that if she had enough faith to come ask, I ought to have enough faith to pray and say, God, 
Let this be a representation of you doing a great work. She took it. We didn't hear no more about it. Came, she came back to church about three months later. Husband in tow, hair on the top of his head. <laughs> I tell you what, I said, now, God, I know you can do everything. And I'm not even sure if he was saved at that time. But she was, took it home, prayed a prayer of faith. And I saw him not long ago. He's quite an old fellow, but he's still got some hair. Um, <laughs> God can do anything. Mother said something, though, that kind of lines up where I, where I want to go on the word. God has really been auctioning me. It's rebuilding, restoration, rejuvenation, church time. Amen. Not just revival. We need restoration, and we need to rebuild the old waste places. If you pretend to yourself that the adversary has not been successful in disrupting some of the good that you were doing before God, some of the anointing that you had from God, then you need to go back and check because the way God is answering me is that we have come through and out of and are still in the midst of a great battle. And it is difficult for me to believe that we came through a battle without any singed hair, without any bruises, without any cuts and scrapes, and without anything in our spirit that we need to tweak and turn. Sometimes God allows tribulation to come so he can work faith and patience in your life to realign you. Mother was so good talking about those cars. My mind ran back 40 years ago about when we had cars in the backyard. And not only did we have the chains and the A-frames to pull the engine, when we had to work underneath them, we didn't have lifts and that. We put a chain on the back of one car, flip the car on its side, fix that side, flip it on the other side, fix the other side, and bounce it down on those new springs and take off. You could go to that junkyard and buy a car for $50. We buy those $50 cars. They were usually Mercury Comets. You may not know what that is. If you can find one now, they're collectible. But we'd buy those cars and you just had to fix whatever was wrong with them. Right. Sometime in the church, we need to remember this is the dressing up room. This isn't the I got it all together room all the time. This is the place you come sometime to say, woe is me, Lord. Mother Price, I believe, is on there by phone. She used to teach me to sing, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. If you are perfected in Christ, pray for me. In those times when my life runs and it gets to that high point and everything's going the way that it should, I pray for you. Now, if we get to a time where the one member's suffering, all the other members need to be praying for that one. Isn't that right? That's how the body survives. That's how the body thrives. That's how the body of Christ grows. So Mother said, you need a little timing chain tweak. And I remember that too, because there was a place on that timing chain and the pistons had to be at top dead center. Yeah. You put the piston at the top and the chain on the right link, yeah. man, new cars would run forever. If you get the word of God lined up in your life and get the Holy Ghost on the right link, God will get you going down the road. But if you don't, you'll find yourself entangled in such a way that you can't untangle yourself and you need somebody else to help untangle That's you. Right. That's why the scripture said, pray one for another that you may be healed. There is a time when you might be the best prayer warrior in the world. Oh, I'm talking fast. I'm trying to get to the message. It's testimony. You might be the best prayer warrior in the world, and what the adversary is going to attack is your ability to pray. That's right. He ain't going to attack whether the prayer works. If you can get it out, it's going to work. He's going to attack your mind, your body, your money, your house, your children, your family, so that you won't open your mouth and pray. Because if you open your mouth, God said he's going to answer. He will get you to murmur, to complain, to curse God, or do anything except open up and say, God, I need your help. Every time you open up and say, God, I need you, God is attendant to that prayer. But your adversary wants to get your timing off. He wants you to pray after things have happened when God said you ought to pray always. You can pray preemptively. Job prayed preemptively for his children her adventure they had seen. He didn't get a report coming home saying, your children into something, they're coming home in the squad. He prayed before he knew what they were doing. Her adventure, they needed a parental corporate covering over them. Sometimes your prayer for your sister, your brother, and all of the people of God needs to be preemptive, not just reactive. Don't just call the pastor and say, it has happened. 
call me and say, Pastor, let's pray about something. I, I see something I don't believe is right. We can touch and agree on that just as well as we can when catastrophe has happened. Now, there are things that are going to happen. It's the way of all the earth, but some things can be prevented. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Some things need a little tweak and a tune up, right. just like those old cars. Right. Amen. Amen. And I thank God that she talked about the hospitals that we go to. I thank God that many of them came out of the church because they have a semblance of God on the wall. They got a cross here and there. And there have been times when she'd been in the room and I had to go find a chapel because things wasn't working in the science realm. I had to go get in the spirit. And I don't know, uh, you know, many of those churches don't understand going in the spirit and speaking to God in an unknown tongue. But the Bible says I can and faith says I will. And sometimes I need a quiet place to speak to God because I'm not speaking to man. I'm speaking to God. Man can't help. I need to talk to God. But in order to do that, we have to unshackle ourselves from the things that the world would put on us. And the world will put everything on you. And when you break, they will laugh and say, you weren't strong as I thought you were. They won't say thank you when they burned you out and wore you out and run you over. They will just look and say, I thought you were more than that. But God gives us a remedy to that. Amen. If you'll go with me to 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 4 through 7, this will be our contextual scripture this morning. It's my endeavor to not be up here too very long, but it's also my endeavor to not let anyone be lost. And if the word of God is unto salvation, then I believe it's appropriate to have the word of God. Amen. Salvation is deliverance from those things that will destroy us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy 2, 4, and 7 says, No man that war entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. We are in a battle, and we are not on our own. God chose us before we chose him, and we need to remember sometime that we are God. The world will try and tell you to do everything you're big enough to do to defy your God, and all God is saying is, you need to remember that it all started with me. Every now and then, it's good to go back and remember when you were in sin, the heartache, the pain, the suffering, the lostness that you felt before God reached out and called you to be in this army of the Lord. Amen. Sometimes we forget that we're on the battlefield for God and we think we're on the battlefield for our own selves or even our own ministry or even our own uh, ambition. But we need to remember you are a part of a much bigger battle than you even know. It started way back when Lucifer decided to challenge God. And the battle has raged on ever since then. And that's when we sing, I'm a soldier. That's the battle you're in. All of the other things might be distractions that he's using to try and keep you from focusing on that eternal blessing that God has promised those that will stand with him now. He said, if you stand with me now and you testify for me now, I'll testify to my father before his angels on your behalf. Go with me quickly. And it's, it's not going to be one that's on the screen because I didn't tell Elder Tony back there about it. Uh, but if you go with me to 1 John, the fourth chapter, it reads thus. And I'm saying to you today, live life, don't fight it. Untangle yourself. So live life, don't fight it. So many times we get caught up in fighting life that we're not living the life that God has already given us. We're in a battle that God has already won. He didn't tell you to go out and go fist to cuff with the adversary. He told you to rebuke him. Why? Because you already have the authority that Jesus won for you. But if you don't invoke that authority, the adversary will have you fighting for stuff that's already yours, struggling for something that you've already been given. Uh, beloved, do not believe every spirit. And it's hard for me to get past this scripture. There's so much falseness out now and all kind of wickedness has gone on into the world. There are many that are against Christ that are in the spiritual realm that come and try and do many things in the spirit. One of the things that caused me to get saved was I got involved with uh, silver mind control meditation in high school. A teacher taught it to us illegally, by the way, uh, and told us that we had all this power and we could astro project and we could do all kinds of stuff. Long story short, when he left us, we were messed up believing a lie because they hadn't got to us with the truth. You couldn't preach religion in school, but you could teach 
all of these other things. You could teach yoga, you could teach mind control, you could teach anything except God. And I got so caught up and they were saying, oh man, you're, you're so good at this. We want you to go to California and open up a, a place for us. We're going to train you to be one of our ambassadors. And you can teach this. And we got these little shops and we got these little places that people come and they sit and, you know, we'll learn about the masters and all of this, which now is nonsense. But to me, I said, oh my goodness, this sounds like a way of doing something. And I asked them one question. When they came in, one of the leaders of this thing had a bad habit of cursing folks out. Uh -huh. And another smoked so bad he could hardly talk. Uh -huh. And I said, before I go out here and do all this other stuff, you're saying you are in ultimate control of mind and body and you can project out of your body. Why can't you project out of this stuff that looked like it's killing you? And of course, the one that cursed so bad got so angry, he started cursing him. The one that smoked so badly, I don't know what he said because he started coughing at me. I'm remembering decades ago now. This was in the mid 70s. But nonetheless, I remember that being the point at which I said, I don't want this. Every time somebody would join that organization, they would come into the induction ceremony and bow themselves before these leaders yeah. and cry and do all this stuff. And it was the saddest thing I'd ever seen. I left there saying, I don't know what's right right now, but I know this is not it. I know there's something in the spirit going on in these rooms, but I know this spirit is not right. I came up in a home where there was a picture of Jesus on the wall and he looked like he was looking at me everywhere I went. And this didn't feel like what my mother told me that Jesus was about. But those were spirits. Oh, yeah. And when folk are believing them now, oh, they're God. still spirits. Yeah, they're right dressed now. up. Right now. They've been taught so heavily, they will entangle you, they will entrap you. And yes, spiritual things are real. The Holy Spirit is real. But unfortunately, the unclean spirit is real as well. And God has to teach the church how to untangle from that uncleanness in order to get into the holiness and righteousness bought for us by Jesus Christ. So he says to them, little children, he's speaking to them as children, even though they're grown folks, beloved, do not believe all these spirits, but test them, try them, whether they are of God. Let me stop here. This scripture never said, try the spirit by the spirit. Never. It says, try them to see whether they are of God. I think Pastor said for this pulpit Bible, I can read that while I talk. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Test those spirits. What does that mean? Why do I say, I was taught in the church, they said, try the spirit by the spirit. You'll never untangle yourself trying the spirit by the spirit. Because if at that time when I was in this right. thing that I wasn't in, all the spirits around me were the same as what they had taught me to see. They said, when you project, this is what you're supposed to see. So how would I have taken those spirits, trying those spirits by my spirit? I was not yet saved. My spirit was not Holy Ghost anointed. Their spirit was not Holy Ghost. You have to try the spirit by the word of God and by God to see whether they're God. When I got saved not long after that and got into the church, the first thing they gave me was a Bible. I couldn't read it. I didn't have the Holy Spirit. I'd sit there and cry because I didn't know what it meant. So I had to then go to church and have somebody preach it to me, teach it to me, talk to me about it, sing to me about it, study with it. I went to uh, Mother Myrtle Davis' house, Pastor Davis, my pastor, and I would sit in her kitchen and say, read this to me. And then the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost and it opened up and started making sense. And I continued to go there and say, read this to me, read this to me. I understand Isaiah because she sat there and said, listen, we're going to teach you Isaiah, and then we're going to show you Jesus from the Old Testament, and then we're going to let Pastor teach you the New Testament, and we're going to get this word down in you, and you'll understand it better by and by. Then they called me to a service, laid hands, and told the devil to get out and the Holy Ghost to come in. I'm telling you that you need to be able to take the word of God and test what the devil is saying, whether it's true or not. If God has said don't, and your spirit is telling you do, that's not God. That's right. It seems simple, but when you are entangled, remember the Timothy scripture was when you are entangled, you are not fighting for God. You're fighting for yourself. You need to flip the script and have God fight for you because he wins. Every time. All right. This kind of teach preaching, if y'all good with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody out there wave your hand. One of y'all got your camera on. All right. Do not believe every spirit. Just because somebody say it came to me in a dream. 
That's right. I had a dream. In my younger days of the pastorate, I was more cynical. I'd ask them what they ate before they had the dream. Was it the pizza, the chili, the taco? What? What? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, now. Amen. Now, when there's a divine dream, I'm good with that. I'm not speaking against what the Bible said, but much of what happens to us, as Mother said, it is our flesh. And in the flesh, the Bible says, dwelleth no good thing. If you're generating stuff from the flesh, the Bible says you're not generating good things. That's true. I don't have time to teach it, but you look it up. In your flesh does not dwell the goodness of God unless the spirit of God has been infused into you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Still. Your Bible said that. I didn't make that up. Whether they are of God, see whether these things are building you up in God or tearing you down, tangling you up in lust and evil desires or loosing you to worship and praise God. Test and see whether they are in what Jesus said. Did you see it in Jesus' life? If you didn't, you don't need it. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world and they're still there. Those spirits of false prophecy are still there. Now they're on the internet. Now they're on your podcast. Now they are amplified, but they are the same root cause of wickedness trying to infiltrate the people of God so that they can silence the church so that the church can't give life to the world. You are the light of the world and you have the life-giving words of the gospel and the devil, if he can't stop it, he wants to infiltrate why? Because God doesn't accept infiltrated work. The enemy will. It's like I used to say, dripping three drops of oil in your glass of milk. How much motor oil can you take in your milk? None. None. How much of the adversary can you include in your life? None. None. Don't throw out the baby, but throw out the bath water. Isn't that right? That's right. So by this, you know that the spirit, this is how you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. In praying for folks that have been oppressed and possessed, one of the things I always listen to is whether they will confess Jesus Christ as Lord, whether they will believe that he died and rose again according to the gospel, because that is the point and starting point of deliverance. That's the place that the enemy does not want you to get. So try the spirits to see whether they will confess uh, Jesus Christ. By this you know the Spirit of God. How? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that tries to name it something else, the great one, the universal mind, the force, is not of God. And every spirit that does not, this is your Bible, I'll get back to the message, this is just textual. All right, 1 John 3, 3, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, not only in the spirit, but physically came here, is not of God. And then the Bible tells us, buckle your seatbelt, because he tells us what spirits those are. I don't care who they're in. Sometimes they're in religious folk. Come on now. There are religious folk that don't believe Jesus physically came. There are religious folk, institutional leaders that do not believe Jesus was born of a virgin. That's right. They will make it so esoteric that that seems like a typology. No, that was real, physical. He ate real food. That's right. He had a real mama. That's right. Right? That's right. And we know he wasn't on Similac. <laughs> Search a little, you'll find out that. <laughs> That's right. uh, hallelujah. You are God. Let's, let me tell you what the second half of the verse. I just want one more out of this chapter. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. When you are searching, be careful because the devil will sell you a counterfeit. It'll think like, it'll look like, you'll think it's God. It'll sometimes shout, sometimes do all of the trappings of the church, but it won't confess the Holy Ghost. It won't confess Jesus. It won't worship in truth and spirit. It won't lift holy hands. It won't study the word to show itself approved, but it will say, I'm a religious thief. But pure religion and undefiled before God is not only to help the widows and the fatherless, it is to keep yourself pure and unspotted from the world. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come to the flesh is not of God. Look at the B part of verse 3. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard, uh, which, had, which had heard was coming and now is already in the world. Wait a minute. This was written somewhere around A.D. 60, 
and the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world. Folk are waiting and talking, saying the Antichrist is going to come. No, he's going to be revealed later in Revelation. He's already got spirits working okay. in the world right now. Right now. And we need to know how to do battle, how to win, how to cast them out, how to do what God said do, how to have power over them. If we don't, the church is weakened. Mm. We become sounding brass mm. that you hit it and it's loud mm. and then it goes off. You can't even remember what the church was if the church doesn't untangle, live life, and not fight life. Because mm. the devil's fighting life on every hand. He's saying, curse God and die. If you are into something and the end result is death, I can pretty much tell you you got that from the atmosphere. Folk will argue with me. Well, I can smoke and be saved. Yeah, you can. Maybe not long. I used to smoke. I can use that one. All right. I coughed in the morning. I read the side of the cigarette pack that said, this may cause cancer. And then later after I quit, they said, may cause death. I don't need the Holy Ghost to tell me not to do something that on the package says may cause death. That's right. God don't have to say you condemned in order to do stuff that you know is good sense. I know it's not from God because God wouldn't give me something, the author of life wouldn't give me something that says will cause death. If you pick that up and say it's strychnine and arsenic's mixed, <laughs> y'all don't like me. Strychnine and arsenic is deadly poison. If you mix them, I, I guess you get double dead. I don't know. But listen, if you get those two things together and somebody says, do this, the simple answer is don't. <laughs> and yet they got stuff now coming out of the corruptness of evilness. They are mixing up drugs now that they said something is on the streets worse than thin. Yeah. Death is almost immediate in some cases. Yeah. And yet folks are searching and they get a lie and the devil tells them it's true. And then they face a yeah. holy God unprepared. Be careful. Mm. Be careful. And pray preemptively for folk that they never get on this stuff. We can pray them off. But isn't it better to pray that they never get on it than to pray them off? We can pray folks out of alcoholism. We've done it. The church has done it. Some members of the church have been it. But isn't it better to never have them get caught up and destroyed in the first place? Isn't it better to preach with enough anointing that they choose life the first time? I didn't. I had to be prayed out of a bunch of this stuff. <laughs> so, so if y'all think I'm on a high horse, I'm not. And some days I went and got a drink and then played the horses. <laughs> Lost my money, came back and went to the church to the altar. But it would have been better had I never had to get delivered from that stuff Amen. than going to church on the altar, crying out to Jesus, teapotting as they say, and folk laying hands on me and praying over stuff that shouldn't have been in my life in the first place. But once I was entangled, I didn't know how to get free other than they said, come to church, come to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. We're almost scared to say that now. Yes, we are. Get some help somewhere. No, get some help here. Yeah. No more. And if you're in the hospital, bring some of here, there. Oh. It got all right. Oh, yeah. All right. So what you've heard was coming in and now is already in the world. Antichrist spirit is already in the world, already fighting the church, already fighting the gospel, already wrapping folks up and possessing them. The good news is... Greater is he that is in you than he that is all the world. Greater is he that's in the church than he that is in all of the world. God has not left the world alone. He's given them the church so that when things get out of control, God has an answer. You are of God, little children. These are older folk. He's talking to them as positional God. You are little children and you have overcome them. Why? Because he who is in you, verse 4, chapter 4 of First John, Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Always remember, the Holy Ghost is more power than whatever you are dealing with. He's dunamis. He's got power from God to deal with your issue. But he's also a perfect gentleman. He's not going to engage unless you ask him to. He's not going to preemptively jump up in the morning and shout you. He's not going to stop you unless you get up in the morning and say, Lord, be with me this day. Strengthen me against every attack. Deliver me from evil, oh God. Let me walk in righteousness. He's there to help. He's not going to force you to do because God gave you another tenant 
and it's free moral agency, you can choose to defy God on any day that you wake up. But you can choose to overcome the adversary on any day that you wake up. You now have to decide, am I going to live the life that Christ has put in me, or am I going to fight for a life that is destroying me? You do have to choose. We can help, we can pray, we can fast, we can consecrate. You still have to want God. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he in you is greater than he who is in the world. Isn't God all right? You can't fight the good fight of faith entangled with all of the fleshly stuff. The sad part about it is the stuff that the flesh desires, Jesus said in Matthew 6, if you seek first the kingdom of God, Gentiles, and come to the church, all these things which the Gentiles seek will be added unto you. You don't have to go out and fight for stuff that God said, if you seek me, put me in first position, the stuff, the houses, the land, the business, the money, the finance, the future, the, the, the people you need will be put in your life by God when you need them to be put there. And he don't care if it takes some ravens feeding the prophet. He don't care if it takes a little boy to feed 2,000, 5,000 with two loaves and five fish. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter to God. You see those folk on the side of a hill listening to the Sermon on the Mount needed to be fed. God didn't care that he had to do an outright supernatural history defying miracle on their behalf. He didn't say apostles go out and fish all day, fish all night, get some fish, fry them up, bake them up. No, he just said, hey, little boy, what you got? And he wasn't looking at the fish. He was looking at his faith. He saw that little child enough faith to bring his and expect God to turn it into enough for everybody else. What if the church came to church thinking that whatever I have, the dollar I have is going to be amplified by God and it's going to be sufficient. Are y'all still with me? Yes. Don't fight life. Live life. You can't war for God when you are tied up warring for yourself. All right? One of the focus scriptures I had in this text is you need to fight to be free. Identify the things that tend to take us from richly enjoying things to serving things. Focus on the stuff that's causing you to serve things rather than God saying you should richly enjoy things. If I'm serving things, I never get the things I want because I'm always chasing the next thing. If I'm richly enjoying things, watch out now, I will be content with such as I have. There was a scripture that talked about that. Who is rich, but he that is content with what he has. Scripture yeah. says that you yeah. ought to be content with such things as you have. That's how you know you're serving things when you're never happy about anything that you get at all. One of the things that I'm dealing with this a lot with, with Josiah and back and forth when we were buying him toys and he told me yesterday, he said, listen, I want a toy, but prior to that, I'm going to give away seven. And he said, if I give away seven things, grandfather, because when he calls me grandfather, he, he planned me, right? <laughs> grandfather, if I give away seven, how big a thing will I get? I said, I don't know, but it's going to be good. You got to try me and see. Because I want to teach him the principle that when you give, you put yourself in a position to receive. He asked me once, he said, well, what am I going to be? I said, you're going to be a prosperous young man, healthy and wise and spoke well in the gospel. This morning he told me, so why, are you, why, why am I looking like a preacher? <laughs> then told Mother Bowers, he go preach. Well, if we can let the barber's son want to be a barber. The policeman's son wants to be a policeman. The fireman's son wants to be a fireman. Isn't that right? The politician's son wants to be a politician. What happened to telling your children, go preach this great gospel? Hey, You'll be blessed beyond measure. And I tell you what, the retirement's out of this world. Yeah. Develop an action plan. First, identify what has entangled me, what has pulled me, what spirit has sunk me into something I don't want to be in, and then say, Lord, I need an action plan to deal with my issue. And then be steadfast. Victory, victory is guaranteed, but you have to be patient to wait for it. God brings you out in due season. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in, somebody say due season. Due season. I've wanted to be exalted when God said be humble, and I've wanted to be humble because when you get exalted, you find out, oh my God, more people depend on me, more burden is on me. Let me be that humble one again, but 
Sometimes it's not so. So the spiritual basis of that was that Paul told Timothy, get yourself free because I need you to work in the gospel. You're a young man, but I need you to set aside all of these weights and other things that are hindering you so that we can go fight this good fight together. When we get caught up in functional things, we end up fighting life rather than living life. If your life has become one giant fight, then you need to get back to these scriptures and say, Lord, somewhere, somehow, something has crept in because I used to just wake up every morning saying, Hadi, Hadi, glory to God. Now I wake up every morning and say, oh my God, what is the day going to bring? I used to wake up in faith of what God would do. Now I wake up in fear of what might happen. And we got to turn this thing back around. Stop fighting life and start living again. I remember once a, a woman told me about something that happened. Uh, she owned some places up in the Dells and she was talking about when she would swim, she jumped off a pier, bunches of people all around a party or whatever. I don't know what was going on, but I was struck by her testimony that she jumped in the water. An expert swimmer kind of grew up on the water just under the surface, got tangled up in the weeds, could see what was going on, but nobody could hear. Mm. Couldn't get free. No one could hear. That's what being entangled is. You in the church, folk may not even know that you're drowning. They don't even know what you're dealing with unless you find a way to let somebody know. And I don't know how she got their attention. Splashed some water, did something. Somebody came and cut one yoke, one stroke of a weed with a knife, and she was suddenly free. God can set you free today. Right today but you got to get God's attention you got to say God I need your help when you hear me saying I cry out to God sometimes when y'all ain't in the sanctuary I'm crying God we need your help Isaiah the 55th chapter asked the question why do you spend money on that which is not bread and labor for that that does not satisfy listen listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will have, uh, delight in the richness of life Stop trying to let your flesh delight enough to make your soul rejoice. It won't happen. Your flesh will just want more and more and more and more. One of the things I remember about the horrible days of my drinking is that it was progressive. One shot used to knock me out. And then it took half a bottle. <laughs> An unknown amount. And then it took over. I knew it had taken over because there was a time when I used to sell all the drink top shelf. And by the end, it got to the point where I would buy what then was called dollar vodka pop off. Never forget it. Russian vodka. <laughs> I think some of the stomach aches. No, I don't because the Lord healed me. But many years I had problems because of drinking that stuff. And much of what I did when I drank it, I do not remember. Wouldn't remember now because the Holy Ghost said, forget it. But that was how I knew I went from possessing it to it possessing me. I look at it and say, I don't want this, but this is all I can afford. And then I got saved. Thank you, Jesus. And God delivered me. Thank you, God. And I ain't had to go back and get a shot glass of anything since 1977. Thank you, Lord. God is that good. And you want to argue with me about whether you should or not? That's not the argument. The argument is what God can and will do for you not what God is doing against you. Quit fighting against God, trying to find the little loophole in the Holy Ghost that you can creep into and say, God, I want the fullness of life. I want joy unspeakable without a bottle. I want the spirit and I don't want it from a liquor store. It amazes me so much. The devil's so bold, he'll put a sign on the liquor store to make sure you can't tell God you didn't know. <laughs> what am I going to buy? Wine and spirits. That's it. And sometimes you get them. Amen. All right. See, because the folk want to argue with me about whether they should or whether they can. I can tell you you shouldn't. I can tell you the results of if you do. And I can also tell you how to get out of when you have. Amen. God has not thrown you away. He's going to get you out of it. Thank Ask yourself if you are using the tools to work the right thing, except the Lord build the house. There's a note to me. I shouldn't have read that. In principle. Listen, except the Lord build the house, you will build it in vain. You will build something that looks good, sounds good, acts like it's good, and when the adversary blows a tempest against it, it's going to shake, rattle, roll, and flip over.
But if the Lord build the house, it's set upon a rock and the wind can blow, the storms can come, the raging of life can happen and you'll bounce back like a green bay tree, snap back after this thing is over, you still in God. Don't let the enemy steal the foundation God has built underneath you just because we have been through something. And unfortunately, we might have to go through something else, but you ought to be stronger next time than you were last time. So make sure you're using all the tools. Pastor, what are the tools? Fellowship with the saints. When the lion want to kill a wildebeest on the nature show, I watch them all the time. They chase them off from the herd and find the one that's willing to go astray. And when that one go astray, they let the herd go. Then the rest of the attackers attack that one. Because where it was a thousand against five lions, now it's five lions against one. Why is it important? Because the Bible said your enemy, the adversary, the devil, go up about and acts like a roaring lion. So I watched the nature show to see how a roaring lion acts. A roaring lion don't say one-to-one, -one, come on, let's fight me and you. The roaring lion say, I'm going to creep up behind you. You ain't going to know that I'm behind you until I strike you. And if you don't run with that herd and get in the middle of that herd, I'm going to take you off to the side and we're going to have a fight for real because I got my buddies waiting in the bushes. That's the adversary that you fight. He don't fight fair. But God said, listen, you stay in the main of the church and you stay in the place where God put you and he will put a shield and buckler around you. He will keep you and protect you. In fact, the enemy will get scared to come up because the herd of God is so strong, he know he gets cast out. You ought to watch those sometime. You understand what the people that Jesus were talking to knew. They were in the place where tigers would come down into Jerusalem and attack them. They understood what he meant. But place your energy and resources in motion toward release from the gilded yokes. The yoke that the Bible talks about when the enemy puts it on you is gilded. It's beautiful. It's pretty. It's something that you might even let the devil put on you because it feels good at the time. But then you find out you don't have the key. You put this upon me and I don't have the key. The good news is the church has the keys. Jesus gave them to Peter and said, Peter, pass them down to the church. You have the keys to unlock the yoke of the enemy and set folk free. Thank you. God. Thank you. Thank you. Don't fight life. Live it. Don't fight the chain. Unlock it. Focus on and develop fertile ground. Luke 8, 4, 8, 8, chapter, verse 4 through 9. And when much people were gathered together and would come to him out of every city, he spoke this parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, was trodden down, and the fowls devoured that. Some fell on a rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell on thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked it. Other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, to you that have ears, listen to what God has said. Listen. You want to be that that's on good ground. Trust me on that. And he said, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. You are kingdom believer. You need to know how the kingdom works. But to others, he spoke in parable because God ain't telling everybody what he's telling you. The seeing they might see and not see. When I pray, I say, Lord, let us see and perceive. This is why. The seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed Go back in this parable and read it. If you didn't know the keys, you wouldn't know what he was talking about. The seed is the word of God. You've been preached the word to over and over and over. It's on the air. It's everywhere. But if it don't get in good ground, the word becomes ineffectual. There were places where Jesus couldn't do many, mighty, many, many, mighty miracles because of the unbelief in the hardened hearts. And he said, you need to know this. The parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are people that hear and then cometh one of those chapter four devils, the unclean spirit, then cometh the devil and taketh the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. This is why you watch under prayer. You can get a great message today. The adversary going to fight it when you walk out there and tell you, well, that wasn't really true. That's why I preach with the Bible open and tell you over and over where the scripture is. Because when he tell you that lie, open your Bible and see if it says the same thing I just preached to you. He's going to try and steal the word, make you so angry you forget, so sad you forget, so whatever that you forget that God has given you a tool. But listen to what God said. When he, the devil, taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. If the word stays in your heart, by inference, you will get saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear, they receive it and they shout. I got joy, 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 joy. And these have no root, which for a while 
believe. They'll hang with the church a, a minute. But when temptation happened, this is Jesus' parable. When temptation happened, you are on a rock, got no roots. You can't hang on through the tough times. My God. Church has been through some stuff. Thank God for all of you that are hanging on. But we got to pray back some folk that were on the rock and couldn't hang on. They fell off. We got to go back and get those folk. God didn't give up on them. Don't expect others to see or endorse your dreams. Focus on what you know. Hmm. All right? You know God. You know what he can do. Don't expect other folks to believe with you. Most folks believe once they see. Hmm. They don't believe without seeing. Hmm. One of the tools of getting out of your rut is believing that God's going to do greater for you than he ever did. The prodigal got a better road than he ever had when he decided to come back. Use everything you know to get going in forward. I'm going to use Mother Bauer's metaphor. Get the car back in gear. That would have kicked you in neutral. Shift into first. Don't go to fifth gear and try and ride high. Just, just put it in first and go slow. If you ain't prayed in a year and a half, just read the Our Father. <laughs> All right? If you ain't fast in a couple of years, just say, well, Lord, from six o'clock until whatever time, I'm gonna give it a shot. Because the Bible says that you humble your soul with fasting and prayer. There are some times that you need to get before God in a period of consecration with your focus in order to get what God is giving you. It won't change God, it'll change us towards God and therefore we can hear from God. Use everything you know to get going. Just picture Mother Bob was in that car she just rebuilt. Yeah, she knows a whole lot more than that, by the way. One of the things I tell you about when Mother and I first got married, I was trying to build a church. Boss came to me and said, you go to work. I can expedite this construction. I said, what are you talking about? She said, listen, I was mixing concrete when I was nine years old. My father was a concrete, cement yeah, mason, bricklayer. Right. All my brothers are tradesmen. You go to work. That's true. I can handle this. <laughs> so if you think the cars were something, just... <laughs> I have mixed mortar on the number that she told me to do from when she was a child being taught by a master craftsman how it's done. Yeah. Use everything you know, getting gear going forward. And if you don't know anything, call somebody that knows and say, listen, I need help. Help me get going forward again. And if I get on the way down the road, I'll help somebody else. Don't fall out based on how things look or sound. That's the ultimate victory for the devil. I'm going to fall out and pout against God. I don't have time to talk about that. The scripture deals with that pretty clearly. Pride goes before a fall. All right? So once you are working your plan, don't panic if you have to revise it. Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. None of it happens. Revise the plan. Right? Live life. Don't fight it. One day with the Lord is better than a thousand years with the adversary. Remember the reason you have to revise it because you are moving forward. You've gotten in gear. You're doing something and the adversary is counterattacking you. So the reason things are happening that didn't happen to you when you start pushing toward God is because the counterattack is on. It's all right. You're still going to win the battle. If you say you don't have to rise, re revise anything, you might be in a rut. Examine yourself in Galatians, and I think we talked about this a few weeks ago, so I won't go through it. Don't be fooled by your own success. Keep an eye on your prayer life. Give time to Bible reading and feed your soul with spiritual songs and hymns. More and more, I'm recognizing the devil is floating in on the wings of some of these songs and lyrics that folks have. I can't believe they're legal. I listen to folk in my car sitting next to me and it's just swearing after swearing after swearing to a beat. Don't matter if you're cursing God to music, you're still cursing God. All right? Don't fight, live life. Amen? Fifth chapter of First John says this, whosoever believes that Jesus Christ is Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten. You love the father who begot Jesus. You love Jesus who the father begot. By this, we know that we love God and are the children of God when we love God and conjunction keep his commandment. One of the identifiers is that the love of God is in us and God is working through us is that we now keep his commandments when we didn't care anything about them. We now love God so much that we want to please God. When your child loves you, they want to do what's pleasing in your sight. There are so many things that your children do to get your attention because they want to hear, well done, child. Good job, honey. You did great. 
and we stand before God, and sometimes we ought to do something just to say, God, did I get that one right? Mm -hmm. God said in this verse, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. They're not grievous. They're not all the stuff that folk put on you, but God does have some commands we need to keep. Love one another is among them. Love God above everything else is leading them. And his commandments are not burdensome. When you get commands that are burdensome, it's not God. If this scripture is true, the stuff that is on you that are making it tough to live life is not God. Now, I did read that the way of a transgressor is hard. But I also read that Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when you got that hard yoke, you ought to check and see whether it's from God or if we put it on ourselves or we let other folk put it on us or somebody gave us expectation because the yoke of God is not burdensome. It says right here, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory. I told you it was coming that he has overcome the world by our faith. And who can overcome the world but he who believes in Jesus Christ? I'm going to stop there. That just gets better and better from there. But listen, I just want to reiterate what we started with. No man can war, and I'm going to put in the fight of faith, if he entangles himself with the affairs of this life, you cannot please God who have chosen you to be a soldier. In other words, you can't have bitter and sweet water at the same fountain. You either got to decide, I'm God, I'm going with God, win, lose, or draw, or I'm going to fight life and fight my way through life for however long I got, and then get cynical and say, life's tough and then you die. Well, no, it's not. Life's a blessing and then I live. Mm. Mm. Tired of the devil saying that too. Mm. And you know they put a curse word in there. But I said, life's tough and then you die? No. <laughs> life's blessed and then I live again. Because yeah. that's what God said. Look at how much the devil has got us, that, that we will walk around saying, life's tough and then you die. Again. All right, one more time. Life's a blessing, and I'm going to live again. She just said again. I'm going to close on that. I can't beat that with a stick. <laughs> Bow your hands, if you would, with me as we close out this prayer. Father, we thank you today for your word. I ask that you would let it go into the lives of your people. Break up the fallow ground. God, root up everything that's not like you. Take away the stony heart and give us that heart of flesh. Give us to call and receive, to seek and find, to knock and have doors open that no man can close. Pour out your blessing upon us. Give us to walk in your favor in life, oh God. You came that we would have life and life more abundantly. I pray the abundance, hallelujah, ah, glory to God. I pray the abundance of the life of God into the life of every everyone under my voice right now. I rebuke the devices of the adversary now and cast them out in Jesus' holy name. Father, you said that you gave us power over all the power of the enemy. I ignite the power of God into the lives of your people by faith right now. Every struggle, every turmoil, every addiction, every affliction, I command to loose right now. You said what we loose on earth would be loosed in heaven. We loose the power of God into the lives of your people. We bind the work of the enemy that is the distraught uh, against them, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We rebuke every disruption to the plan of God, and we call for faith alive right now in Jesus' name. God, we cannot do it without you. We labor together with you, but with you we can do all things, and nothing now is impossible. Call faith alive. You've given faith unto everyone by measure, God. Increase our faith today in Jesus' holy name. Let the